may liberate, liberate some of us, as, as the previous um, presentation highlighted, at some points from individual and temporarily wage relations, but it cannot liberate us collectively from capitalist social relations by itself. However, the decommodification of labor power makes human life more livable. Anyone who considers that, for example, universal free healthcare or public quality, quality education are simply capitalist tools of domination might want to check their own privilege. Capitalism has no need to provide universal free healthcare, and in fact, it's quite able to reproduce itself quite successfully by employing underage workers, letting people become disabled from diabetes, or placing children in danger by going to school, as we can see all too often in the United States. The third element of, of COMPASS um, would be the strengthening of the power of civil society to shape the priorities for the use of social surplus and the organization of economic activity. And I think in, in that case, um, Wright alerts us of the trap, if I may say so, of proposals that reinforce statism rather than socialism, the, highlighting um, the power in the sense of, of society. In the case of UBI, this could open possibilities of social organization beyond the state. Not only could enhance some mechanisms for economic democracy, but also provide tools for economic self-management. As we saw during the cycle of struggles um, that started around 2011, it was really encouraging to see a lot of prefigurative practices in socio-economic and political self-management that could only have been expanded by UBI. And they provide important um, learning and consciousness-raising experiences that can actually help us to create socialist futures today. Um, as I mentioned, I, I would like to add um, a fourth pointer to, to the socialist compass, and this is actually trying to bring in some of the Marxist critiques to, to UBI proposals. And so I, I'd like to build in that case from, from Dinerstein and, and Anna Dinerstein and Harry Pitt's um, critique. So for many UBI proponents, and usually when we think of UBI proponents from a Marxist perspective, we tend to think of post-Marxists such as Hart and, and Nevi. But for, for those, you know, they very much kind of, um, and I'm quoting here, oh, I've just gone louder, <laughs> and I'm quoting here um, Dino Stein and, and, and Pete, and they say, work is open to question, but at the expense of questioning the wider circumstances that make it what it is in capitalist society. The rule of value, whereby productive activity is structured by certain concrete social relations and produces certain abstract social forms in commodities exchange by means of money. And that's the end of the quote. I actually agree with, with that, and I think that a, a UBI proposal, the void of an understanding of capitalist social relations and money, will offer little more than short-term relief. And I hope that we can use a, a UBI proposal to kind of really build that compass, not just um, provide short-term relief. And there's an important element, and here I hope um, many UBI proponents will forgive me. I think UBI is not only a very difficult proposal to ever become a reality beyond local experiments, but it is also a proposal that is developed to its full potential, and I think um, most of us in this room are well aware of that, will, pre will place an enormous strain on the financing of public services as a whole. Some critics worry that the UBI, in the context of authoritarian neoliberalism, will be an excuse to replace existing policies and programs. Furthermore, increasing um, income tax at the time when incomes are disproportionately taxed vis-a-vis -vis other forms of wealth accumulation needs to be seriously considered when thinking about um, a UBI proposal. So, for example, um, some proposals out there connecting with the issues that I was mentioning of real estate, perhaps also in, improving certain taxation on money that comes from rents and other types of, of forms might actually be, be useful in, in some aspects. But also, and, and that's one of the key things, is that to avoid UBI becoming an excuse to replace existing policies and programs will also very much depend on the social forces and behind defending a, a UBI proposal. And so, you know, I, I don't think I have resolved at any point how we can defend a UBI from the critic of the political economy, but I think there is certainly a lot more conversation that, that can happen. And what is clear from previous social reforms is that we can't underestimate, uh, underestimate the emancipatory horizons of proposals that allow us to prefigure alternative possibilities. A key factor for such possibilities, as I mentioned, comes from the social forces that defend alternatives during specific historical moments. So, and I as I started with Marx, I'm going to finish with Marx again in his early writings. He, 
in one of his, he, I quote here, capital is therefore the power to command labor and its products. And I claim that proposals that have the potential to reduce the power of capital to command labor and its products have actually the capacity to build a post-capitalist future. And I'll leave it here. Okay. Thank you very much, Monica. And now, um, Luis, so it's your turn. Okay, can you hear me all right? Yep. You can hear me? All right, all right. Well, I always try to be provocative, so it'll probably <laughs> be the case again. Um, I, was, I was going to distinguish between two types of narrative about basic income. I think we need to realize that basic income is essentially, or the story or the advocacy, uh, writing about basic income is all about narratives. We, we don't have a basic income um, in place, but we have lots of narratives about what basic income represents, where it might come from, what it might achieve, where it does come from, etc. I, I, I like to think that the narratives about basic income are part and parcel of the emergence and the transformation of capitalism, and that those narratives, by the same token or by contrast or by paradox that root themselves in transformations of or with, from within capitalism. And I include Eric Golden Wright to a certain extent. Uh, was he, he was a conference, I think it was the 30th anniversary of Biang, where we held it uh, in, uh, in Brussels. And, and he mentioned the four different routes through capitalism. One of, the, one of them was to smash capitalism. He discarded that. And he said the most realistic is probably to transform capitalism from within. And I worry about all of these narratives about the relationship of basic income and capitalism. <laughs> because I think, and I will elaborate a bit more, I think that what we've seen ever since in the modern narrative, at least since the 1960s, uh, which is when basic income security became an embedded project of capitalism since the new classical th synthesis, when Keynes was brought in within classical economics and we had new classical economics, it's become more and more accepted, and now it's extremely normal to say or to think that states now ought to and can secure capitalism by sustaining the consumption of the population. And yet, even though we've had this narrative since the 1960s, it has, of course, not happened. States have spent more, but we've not gone anywhere near in the direction of universal basic income. We've gone more, more and more in the direction of conditionality, sanctions, uh, the latest announcement of the UK government is while it's cutting taxes in the autumn budget, it's going to make all disabled work from home on the pain of losing their subsistence. So what I'm trying to say is this idea or the hope that somehow universal basic income can come about through or with capitalism or even against capitalism, all of that, I think is highly illusionary and it's kind of a fantastical narrative. And you get this fantastical narrative from the right, but you also get it from the left opposition. You know, there, there is this tangle can be and capitalism can be, can be changed by securing it uh, in a more perfect way uh, through universal basic income. I want to highlight a more important narrative, and one I think is, has been very important in Spain, um, which is, of course, the civic republican narrative which is, I think, is, is a narrative and a case for basic income that is in smaller letters. It's not so fantastical, it's not so ambitious, uh, but it requires something more. It requires something for itself, before itself, which is the creation of a civic public, but also the conception of a civic public. I've been rereading uh, Hannah Arendt uh, lately, partly because I've been studying the 1960s narratives about securing consumption and the new classical thesis. And of course, Hannah Arendt became quite optimistic uh, in the 1960s about the prospect of overcoming um, the problems of modernity that she had identified in her major work. And the reason she became quite optimistic, I think, turned out to be, turned out to be wrong about that, actually. Her optimism was not as important as her pessimism was, but her optimism was about the advent of technology. She thought that perhaps by ending poverty via technology or global campaigns to end poverty, maybe then you might have a space where people could, where, where real durable worlds could come about, 
created by people and, and they attaining some sort of permanence, which is, of course, how she saw the world. She saw modernity, the bourgeois modernity, as an uprooting, as a, a sort of storm into which all factors of production entered, a kind of endless striving. And what she wanted was for a more stable, permanent, durable world um, where individuals did things just for the sake of, of doing them rather than for the sake of exchanging goods with them uh, or consuming more and so on. But she, so she had this optimism, which I think turned, I mean, we know, of course, turned out to be uh, wrong. She was also very optimistic about the rebirth of the civil society in the United States, um, and the civic movement in the 1960s. But actually what happened was there was, a, it, it was the consolidation of market technocracy, which was the implementation of income support programs at the margins. And so I think the story of the 1960s, when you get these quite utopian discourses, um, uh, which were then quite quickly contradicted by the reality of a new market technocracy, where this secures capitalism, has generated a kind of confusion in, in, in the discourse. It has generated quite a lot of scope for a so-called uh, devil's, well, for a so-called left-right alliance around basic income. And if you look at uh, advocacy for basic income around the world, you often hear this talk about there's now this new global consensus, this left-right consensus. Uh, and that is, that is something that's going to get us nearer to a basic income. I actually think it's getting us further and further away from a universal basic income. So what I think, how I think we should conceive the narrative is, is more subtle now, I mean, the challenge. And of course, cost basic income is very, very important, but it's not important as a, as a um, stopgap measure of securing capitalism. It's important in, in relation to an entirely different project, which is political development, right? Which is the old liberal project. And again, I come back to Hannah Arendt because Hannah Arendt made a very sharp distinction between what she saw as her version of political liberalism and civic republicanism and capitalism. These two things were not compatible. Um, and and when one of the ways I think that, although she wasn't writing about basic income per se in some of her most important works, but she talks about uh, political development, liberal uh, institutions, uh, civic, uh, humanist civic institutions, and the making of laws that would secure an appropriate relationship between the public and private worlds and the use of the law, one of the things it would do, it would create a space in between, a space in between spheres, so a space in between individuals, a space in between the public and private sphere, a space in between the individual and his or her work. And that's what basic income does. It help um, develop this idea of a more differentiated public in which individuals can thrive by being a part and then engaging with each other. Um, and it's that kind of narrative that we need to focus on. Unfortunately, it's very difficult for that to take hold within the modern discourse, uh, which, as I said, is, is more fantastical. But I think if you look historically at where has basic income looked most likely in reality, now we're not talking uh, about what people have said, but where you've come closest to having unconditional entitlements. And I think... Uh, certainly, of course, I look at Nordic states quite a lot in their history, uh, and they are different in between them. But um, although, and I've contrasted the UK and, and Denmark quite a lot in looking at anti-poverty policies, the UK was the first, not surprisingly, to implement anti-poverty policies totally with the Elizabethan poor laws. And so this, this 1960s narrative about securing capitalism is, of course, very, very old. Um, but it took Britain much longer than it took Nordic states to implement something like non-traditional interventions. And it wasn't a big announcement in the Nordic states, but it happened 30 years before it happened in Britain. It happened in, in 1891. Um, and it happened in the context of the rise of a number of civic associations that created a mutual assurance at the time and still govern mutual assurance societies, consumer societies, housing associations, savings banks, all kinds of things like this, which ended up being supported and assisted by the state. But as I've argued in some recent papers, 
I think this kind of civic republicanism, rather than rather than the Nordic state being your classical welfare state, so can also be seen as civic republics in this sense. That certainly the Danish case, society shaped the state. <clears throat> civic republicanism shaped the state and the laws. Um, now, why did basic income not come about in this context historically or, or fully? And I think it's because other priorities took over and income security was quite well established. Workers' rights were quite well developed uh, and, and continued to develop in the post-war period. But when we see a crisis again, uh, in, and, and you often see basic income, of course, coming uh, on the agenda in crises, uh, small or large crises, it's in the 1970s. And in the 1970s, the movement for basic income was strongest, nowhere stronger than in, than in Denmark, where a number of publications were uh, came out. But interestingly, in this context, basic income was seen as a small element in the wider transformation of work and of the state and of the society in a civic direction. It wasn't the leading element, but it was a part of that wider civic movement. And I think, I, I think there's some lessons there that in reality, basic income or something like it is more likely to come about where, you have, where there's a wider vision uh, in society in, in the direction of a civic republicanism. What can we do in the, in the states where this isn't the case? So in, in the big capitalist centers of the world, including the UK, I think again, we should be, be careful about the fantastical story. And I'll give, a, if I have time, a couple of examples of this story. And, and perhaps just focus on the more mundane, incremental um, arguments which relate to the violation of civic freedoms, again, liberal freedoms, in the context of the emergence of the sanctions, the persistence of sanctions policies. Because I think there is a growing consensus in the UK. I don't think the labor movement has been very good, actually, at you know, really campaigning around basic income in the UK. I think it's been very, very good at campaigning for just wage increases recently within individual sectors. But I think the labor movement in Britain has never been that good at practicing solidaristic policies across the board in the way that it has been in Nordic states, for example, or in other European countries. Um, but I think what you can do in countries like the UK, which is more likely to win the argument, is to make the case for civil rights and civil liberties uh, and the way in which current sanctions policies are, are violating those liberties. Uh, and, and of course, that's happening all over the place. So, but it's the civic route then, rather than the uh, reforming capitalism route that I'm arguing for. And why not the reforming capitalism route? Because I think the discourses and the lies about capitalism in relation to basic income and how basic income can or would restore capitalism um, are, you know, they, they, they're wrong and, and they are misplaced and they are misrepresented truth, they distort and deflect from reality. Look, for example, at Elon Musk. Uh, uh, was it last week on the 6th of November? He sat down with uh, Richie Shuna and had a little chat. And uh, this is when Elon Musk came up with a new term. Have you heard it? Of course, the universal high income, right? I mean, come on. And this is talking to Rishi Sunak, the last man in the world. To, uh, he, was, he was unique, actually, among prime ministers during COVID in saying he would not even look at or consider universal cash transfers. Right? He would rely on universal credit and he would rely on the furlough scheme. But he wouldn't go you know, where, where the United States went or Chile went or other countries and, and implement checks. And of course, the first thing he did after the pandemic was to, against the campaigns from all civic organizations and labor unions in the UK, uh, he put down universal credit, 25 pounds down again per week, the rise that, 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 that the small rise that had been implemented uh, during COVID. So it's just like a dialogue of the deck. You have Elon Musk saying something fantastic, which actually will require someone like Sunak to find the money. Where's he going to find the money? Not from Elon Musk. And then you've got the IMF um, it's, uh, a few years ago in its fiscal monitor arguing for universal basic income. IMF. Uh, although it was arguing that uh, universal basic income might be okay in India, but not in Europe, because Europe can police people, but they cannot police people in India. So for the IMF, the reason to, to argue for UBI is that it's an easier way 
where the state is weak to secure consumption, right? So all of these narratives, uh, all these hopes that the left uh, and basic income supporters often pin on these statements where people come out and say, okay, we're okay with universal basic income. They always have an underside. They always have a dark side, right? Um, so I don't know, I might be running out of time. Um, but, but I think that this is just my, my <laughs> sort of any in with the pound is just to say I'm slightly worried about the fantastical narratives. I think uh, it's great that universal basic income is becoming more popular, but with its popularity has come a series of evil deals. <laughs> we, we really, really need to be careful and go back and look at the civic republican argument basic income, which are more important in my view. Okay. Thank you very much, Luis. Uh, yeah, thank you both, because you were both like 15 minutes, a little bit more, so uh, yeah, thanks a lot for that, uh, because we started late, so we're running out of time, and that's why I wanted to ask you also about historical perspectives, but I won't do that, so I will just make three questions to you, so that we have t some time to interact with the public. So I wanted to, to ask you both about social and political impacts of basic income. I mean, how does basic income influence social dynamics and political structures? Are there significant changes observed in social equality, individual freedoms, or political participation? So you will have like three, four minutes each uh, yeah, to answer I this. I need to give my, my cable for my battery, but I'll be back. Yes. Okay, Start perfect. Okay, perfect. So, Monica, okay. go ahead, please. Eh, no sé si se ha traducido, si sí, no, me imagino. Pero bueno, sobre implicaciones sociales eh, y políticas que pueda tener la, la renta básica. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, I suppose, for me, I prefer to answer the question in terms of the political and social impacts of a proposal of UBI, because as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm, I'm not an, an expert necessarily on the actual um, um, pilots that, ha that have been done. So um, I think, I find that at least the part that interests me more is, is the potential of, of the proposal to, to, to actually create under, under a particular banner um, a new struggle um, over the material conditions of, of life. And I think that's, that's what makes it very interesting. And I go back to, to what I mentioned. I think one of the, one of the things I, I, you know, most of my work um, over the last decade or so, and, and a little bit before as well, has been on social and labor movements that actually not just protest something, but actually within that protesting, they build something beyond um, today. So they, they prefigure um, some kind of emancipatory future today in the way that they're organizing, in the way they're, they're doing. And I think UBI has the potential as a, as a proposal mm -hmm. to initiate that possibility of start prefiguring um, what a post-capitalist future might look like. And if implemented or piloted in particular places, it could perhaps you know, really open up those possibilities for self-management, for experimenting new ways of, of organizing our social and, and political life. And so to me, that's kind of what, what I find it quite fascinating because that perhaps, in my view, is the more emancipatory potential of it, not so much the debate over um, value or money, which I think we, we need to have, but the, the possibilities of it are precisely in that in the emancipatory prefiguration. <coughs> so, you know, as an example, as as many of you know, know I, I spent the last decade researching anti-austerity movements in in Britain and and Spain and, and kind of within the the EU framework. And what we saw in that last decade was a lot of that prefiguration. So, for example, one of the movements that that I spent a long time researching was the housing movement um, here in, in the Spanish state, the, the PA, the Plataforma de Afectados por la Hipoteca. And in that 
And that movement is something that happened relatively soon. So, you know, initially um, it was basically the type of campaigns were trying to stop people from getting evicted from their homes, which, you know, it's a very kind of direct action type of thing. You, you just get a bunch of people and, and you place them outside the, someone's front door that's about to be evicted. But even that action actually very quickly became prefigurative because even though it just seemed a very basic thing of placing bodies outside someone's front door, the fact that placing those bodies outside someone's front door became a successful tool was actually showing that there was a different way of organizing, or there was a different way of dealing with individualizing legal relations or contract relations that are characterized by mortgage contracts, for example. Right? And so those kind of elements. And then very soon, you know, within two or three years of the movement, a new strategy appeared, which was called the Obra Social Empa, which was basically kind of a, an ironic term because the banks, um, many of the banks, the, the savings banks in the Spanish system prior to the banking reform were not allowed to generate profits. And so the profits that they generated, they had to reinvest them in, in the community through social programs and, and all sorts of things. And those were the, the, the obra socialis. Mm -hmm. And so the obra socialis actually, when banking reform came with the capitalization of banks, um, were scrapped straight away because obviously at that point they were able to, 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 to generate profits so they didn't have to reinvest those profits. And so the, the power, what, what they did was to create this obra social, which basically what it was, was to squat the buildings that were owned by banks, or the banks that had been saved by public money, and then use them to rehouse people that had been evicted from their homes. By doing so and cre creating, you know, basically self-managing the right to housing of people and organizing the right to housing outside the state and outside economic relations was very much prefiguring a, a beyond a, a future um, today. And you know, can you imagine if at that point we had had a UBI, what would be the possibilities of combining that element of people actually taking their future into their own hands, self-managing their housing futures, but also being able to self-manage their income futures. The challenge that that would have posed to capitalist social relations would have gone well beyond housing and credit relations as, as it did at that point. So I think, to me, that's, those are kind of some of the possible impacts. In, in a sense, it, one of my favorite slogans since I was a teenager, and perhaps I'm still a teenager at heart because I still quite like it, it's, uh, I'm from Barcelona, and it's a very popular slogan in many protests in, in Barcelona that says, if they do not let us sleep, we will not let them, no, if they do not let us dream, we will not let them sleep. Right. And, and so, to me, UBI um, basically allows us to dream of social and political futures that are not necessarily mm. part of, of today yet. Mm. Mm. Okay, thanks, Luis. Yeah, I forgot the question. I was just listening to Monica. <laughs> <laughs> Social and political impacts uh, that a UBA could have. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, equality. I mean, yeah, sorry. Well, I mean, I, I think I just wrote a book called The Case for Universal Basic Income. I wrote quite a critical version, and then the publisher said, you need to be more positive. So I, I, you know, I did the most positive thing I could do. But, uh, and one of the things I argued there is essentially like what I said before, I think UBI is part of constituting the basic framework of a society. And it comes back to civil rights. If people don't have unconditional rights to subsist, I mean, what do they have? What liberty do they have? And so it, for me, it's just so elementary. It, it is not a utopian dream in this sense. And I like to focus on uh, how basic uh, the case really is and, and how painful the injustice of what we live under is. Uh, and, 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 you know, we don't need to, in my view, go so far as to talk about post-capitalist future. But I mean, of course we can, or, or talk about utopian alternative societies or work, anything like that. I think we just need to stick to the basic liberal script and give people civil rights. No? Uh, and I think um, it would have an enormous uh, importance. First of all, it would lift some of the health injustices that are linked uh, to our current benefit systems. 
uh, and they are widespread and, and undocumented. Some are documented, some are undocumented. But uh, I did a report for the World Health Organization on what we call base, universal basic income policies. These are policies, uh, the trials, the things that have been done that, that, that appear to show uh, positive results in the, in, in the direction of basic dignity, uh, using your time in, in a different way, uh, well-being, and so on. But also document, documenting the opposite, uh, how the current system uh, creates uh, bad health, kills people, as a matter of fact. I mean, we have very scary statistics in the UK, uh, which, you know, are kept from the public eye. Uh, but one statistic I saw was, um, I believe it was over 80,000 people over a number of years that had died following one year of disqualification from benefit. So, you know, it is so elementary. Uh, uh, and we need first to make people conscious uh, of what we... The, the, you know, it's almost um, fascistic what we're doing today, and, and it's embedded, it's accepted, and it's normalized. But I also think there's something Monica mentioned, uh, this, which is to talk about the uh, effect that even a very low basic income might have on motivation, on action, both outside you know, of the scope of, of normal society, but also just in terms of working life. Uh, because at the moment, um, the disincentives to take up work and manage work are so huge under the current benefit system that we are keeping people in passivity, whereas what we say we're doing is activating people. So, it, you know, I mean, if we want to live up to the things we say we want to do, protect liberal rights, dignity, uh, and incentivize people, then, of course, we need to remove conditionalities on income support, and we need to do it uh, for everybody. I mean, one of the worrying trends, I think, is, is that, especially in the UK, it seems to be the case, um, the debate about basic income and about the piloting, the attempt to do experiments to show that basic income works, tends to be so heavily targeted at specific narrow constituencies that we never get to make the general case. And therefore, it's what I mean about the basic income narrative sort of following trends of capitalism, following the narrative by trying to, uh, in this case, target the most vulnerable and see, well, how would they behave, putting it under a microscope. You know, and it's precisely what we don't want to be doing. So, so we want to test out if we're going to do an experiment or pilot much more generally uh, to put, convince the whole of the population uh, of, of the enormous benefits that there are to them. Um, so yes, undoubtedly there are, there are benefits, uh, but, but they, they, they have, you have to qualify them. Don't say we will have a new society because the benefits will be low. Uh, so it's a small thing, it's a small change, but very important. Okay, thank you very much, Luis. Uh, so as you both extended a little bit, uh, <laughs> I'll make just one more question, uh, which encompasses both, both questions I have to do. So um, there are just three things, and you can extend a little bit. Challenges, critiques, and future possibilities. Yep. You already spoke a little bit about challenges and critiques, so yeah, if you can go a little bit more on that. Uh, challenges, critiques, future possibilities. So maybe we end up a little bit positive here. <laughs> okay. I don't know. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Do you want me to go? Or? Um, as you want. So in terms of, I mean, I kind of mentioned some of the critiques that I think are, are important to, to highlight. And, and of course, the challenges, at the end of the day, they, they are political. And, and basic income is, is the type of, of proposal that, you know, at least I've been following it as, as a proposal for 20 years now. And, and in the last 20 years, we've all seen kind of moments where, you know, it has really achieved um, somewhat of a public debate or somewhat of, of an interest, and then times when there is pretty much, you know, it's basically four people left behind kind of holding the, the banner. So, so this kind of um, quite... And so what I'm trying to say is, is really the, the key challenges um, have to do with the situation, at the, the broader political situation at the time and type of social forces that at that time have the ability to, to campaign for a basic income. The strength of the proposal, and it's also its weakness, I, I suppose, is that 
it is a proposal that can unite many of us. Okay? It's a proposal that, in, in many ways, you know, I, I consider myself a Marxist, I know many people in, in this room um, are not, and many others are, and that's okay. You know, it's, it's absolutely fine, and in fact, it, the, in, what's actually good about it is basic income allows us to find that particular point in which we might have theoret well, we should have theoretical arguments, and we should have, um, we should be discussing theoretically, and we should be in opposition to each other in some aspects of, of the theory. But politically, we find a common ground, and we don't have so many of those proposals going around. Okay, and I think it's more and more important to try and find those types of proposals, such as basic income, that many of us can actually go, okay, on that, politically, we can agree. We might not necessarily agree on what it means for the future. We might, you know, some of you here might want a basic income to save capitalism from itself. And that's a, you know, that's fine. I will disagree with that. Um, and many of us will disagree with that. And, and that's okay, but we can still fight for that proposal to, to be there. And then, you know, we'll, we'll go our own ways trying to challenge capitalism or not in, in, other, in other aspects. And why I think finding those common grounds is so important is, well, the situation today is not the situation I've been describing from 2011. We have a situation today where in, in the UK, in the Spanish state, in the United States, in Holland now, in Argentina, in Italy, and I'm kind of losing track of, of all the places I'm, I'm leaving many behind, we have increasingly a real threat of not just the far right, but I think we can start calling it fascism without being too um, worried and about it. And, and that is real. That is very much there, that's coming. And if those of us that do not <laughs> think that we want to have a, a kind of a fascist future or an increasingly authoritarian um, future based on xenophobic and other types of, of proposals, we need to start finding those common grounds. We need to start building kind of broad coalitions in, in many aspects that can help us at least get through, through that time. And I think in terms of future possibilities, I think UBI has that capacity because it really has a, a huge ability to, to put together people that in many other aspects we probably would, would not. And I think one of the you know, one of the big examples really is what, what we're seeing in, in Catalonia over the last um, few years is very encouraging because we are seeing really that combination of, of social and political forces that, you know, let's not kid ourselves either, you know, that this, um, even within um, each political and social movement, not everyone necessarily is, is on board. But there is, you know, people within different um, groupings or, or belief systems <coughs> that are putting enough effort into, into it. And if, if anything, it, you know, as I said, it, it can give us that, that, that possibility of, of change. And so in terms of future possibilities, it, um, you know, the question is not so much whether we can afford basic income, but can we not afford to fight for it? That perhaps is my, my point. OK, thank you very much, Monica. Uh, Luis? Your turn. Yep, I'll try not to be too long. I mean, I slightly disagree with Monica there because I think it does matter how we argue for it. Um, I, I, I do think that easy agreements on basic income may not get us and we, I mean, where we want. Um, I, th I think actually what we need to recognize is that basic income will not come about on its own or by argument alone. I think we actually need to look at the, the foundation. So it's a case of rebuilding the public uh, and everything that goes with it. So that includes rebuilding rights to work, do I want good work? And therefore I do support trade union struggles and I think they are aligned with universal basic income. I just wish both sides would agree on that. <laughs> you know, basic income supporters have a tendency to sort of dismiss uh, labor unions as, as outdated and irrelevant, uh, right? And uh, labor unions are naturally suspicious of, of basic income supporters for that reason. And we see that in Nordic states, where you know the union movement resists basic income because they think it's a libertarian proposal, right? Um, 
So I actually think it doesn't matter how we put the argument if we really want to get it off the ground, because I don't think you get it without rebuilding the republic. And that means uh, better rights to work, but it also means uh, taxation and reformalizing the economy as a common project once again, you know? Uh, and actually, the, it's just, so to the superficial talk, I worry about uh, the IMF, Elon Musk, and so on. I mean, it's, it's good that they're talking about it. Okay. But it's our opportunity to say, well, not the way you are talking, not the way you are talking. Um, and, and so the last point is just um, in the same context, it's important for people to understand that we're talking about an institutional change that's permanent. Otherwise, it's not a basic income. Right? And I think a basic income has been confused with assistance schemes, temporary schemes. Uh, the UN Development Programme brought a report called the Temporary Basic Incomes in 2020. I mean, it's a great report. I think it's a good thing. Um, but of course, there's no such thing as a temporary basic income. Right? Um, and so we need to explain what it forms a part of. What, what long-term project, uh, I say political development, I say it's about uh, building political institutions, yeah, liberal institutions, but not capitalist ones. Mm. Okay, thank you very much, Luis. Eh, bueno, es un placer escucharos, escucharos hablar. Eh, muchas gracias a las dos. Eh, pero bueno, mmm, también por respeto un poquito hacia las personas que están trabajando, vamos a abrir el turno de preguntas al público. A ver, ¿Algún valiente, alguna valiente? ¿Alguien? Sí, ahí arriba. ¿Alguna pregunta más? No, no. Tengo una. Tenemos una pregunta. Y aquí una otra. Sí, sí, sí. I don't know if you hear Luis. A ver. I cannot hear. No. Yes. I could not hear it. Ah, Thank you no. very much for yep. for your presentations. Um, I would have a quick question. Um, I'm. Um, well, very interested in the uh, UBI and also other aspects uh, related to in, um, monetary reform, international monetary reform. And I was wondering whether you in your research have been exploring synergies between these two research proposals. Is, I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, uh, details of the international monetary reform proposals which relate to the fact that uh, they try to question how money is created. Uh, the critique is that money is created by uh, mainly by my, um, private institutions. In some cases that's even against the, the constitution. Uh, and, well, there is an international movement uh, trying to democratize this uh, money creation. And I see, like, thematically several synergies, and I was wondering if you've explored any uh, related issues in, in your research. Maybe you have some tips on authors or anything, I would be, I, I would appreciate it. And if you don't, then don't worry. <laughs> Thank you. Are we yeah, we're collecting. Or do you want to collect? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, another one. Yeah, we've got here one. Then David. 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 <laughs> Hola, buena tarde. Um, una pregunta para para Luis. Um, he eh, entendido, creo que he entendido, que considerabas que el consenso izquierda-derecha mmm, sobre el tema de renta básica universal eh, no nos acercaba, sino que nos alejaba quizá del, del objetivo de transformación o, o de, del capitalismo. Entonces, me gustaría que argumentaras si es así el, esa hipótesis. Well, I, I, I couldn't hear everything. <clears throat> I think it's something to do with the with the right, the agreement on the right. Ah, you want... 
Yeah, she's asking whether you think the consensus and um, kind of left-right wing consensus on, on basic income mm. is actually a problem and, and brings us mm. further away from the objective of transforming capitalism. Um, well, I'll take that into part. I'll quickly reply to that, sorry, before I, I mean, I think it's a problem, yes. I think it's a problem because I think it doesn't clarify. Uh, but, but, I mean, as long as, I mean, in one way, it starts a conversation, you can see it that way. But I think you, you cannot leave it there. Consensus is a problem. We need to have a discussion, not a consensus, and just leave it there because, um, I think it, it, it provides the real question. Uh, and it's a kind of comfort blanket. It's a kind of leg legitimating discourse. And it's a bit like neoliberalism. Neoliberalism has been saying, you know, for, or neoliberals have been saying for 60 years, just wait a little longer. Wait a little longer. The market will work, you know? And it is, it's the same for me. It's like, a, you know, let's talk more about it. And, you know, there'll be this wonderful future with a high basic income or basic high income. It, it, to me, it means nothing. Uh, so, so I do worry about it. I don't know if that answered the question. <laughs> but it, I mean, the only, positive, the only positive is it gives us an opportunity to take the right to task. And that's necessary. Yeah. Can I just say to clarify one thing, actually? When, when I meant the consensus, I did not mean the consensus left and right consensus over UBI, but rather the consensus within left progressive forces in, in the sense that we might have different visions of, of UBI within, within left and progressive forces, but that actually it is a, a proposal that can help progressive forces work together. I actually uh, agree with, with Louise over you know, Musk's proposal and even different experimentations, for example, of, of the conservative government in, in Britain over universal credit and other things that actually are nothing but um, a perversion of what um, UBI might might possibly be. So, so yeah, I'm, I didn't mean in terms of, of UBI as yeah, yeah. possibly defended by, by Elon Musk, but rather this kind of more progressive forces that, that we might actually genuinely disagree over, over a lot of things, mm -hmm. but, but UBI is a progressive proposal. That's just to clarify, right. sorry. <laughs> so we, we get into a kind of consensus here. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, David, yeah? Con, con micro si escucha. Sí. ¿Me escucha en catalán también? En catalán escucha, no sé si entenderá catalán. No, pero, 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 ¿Pero tiene traducción o no? No, no, no tiene traducción. Okay. Yes, hello, Luis, I'm David Casasas. Um, uh, I thought you had translation. Um, I have one question for, for, for each speaker, and first of all, thank, thanks a lot for, for such uh, uh, a couple of inspiring talks. Uh, first, Monica, uh, I would like to ask you, uh, when, when you were talking about the uh, obra social from, from La Paz, and you said, imagine if uh, we could have we, we could have uh, coupled both things, uh, it came to my mind something that I have been discussing with, with colleagues and, 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 and thinking um, myself, which is, uh, so, but, but this is a, is a purely innocent question to someone who's working on critical political economy, which I also try, try to do. Uh, because at some point you mentioned uh, the issue of, um, well, imagine if we had uh, the housing thing and then some uh, um, income security. But to me, basic income, maybe this is vague and magical uh, thinking, but to me basic income is not only income security, but it's some, it, it could be, but I, I, I want to, to, to hear you about that, about, about that. Uh, a way, something translatable, in terms of um, a, a path toward toward uh, towards uh, a collective control of the means of production. Now it sounds very 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 wide, but it gives you um, time in order to negotiate um, better um, social relations. It gives you some propensity to risk uh, in order to explore options which is which rich people can do, but uh, the majority of people cannot do. It gives you a fallback position. Now, um, so um, th these three things and other things don't translate immediately into collective control of the means of production, of course. But 
does, do you think that this can uh, approach us to, 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 to that um, goal um, very, very broadly conceived? Um, it has to do with the, 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 purely, the, 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 the truly transformative uh, effects of, of basic income. And linked to that, I, I, I was very, very, very interested in, in Louis's, as, as always, uh, uh, contribution, but there was something that struck me a little bit when you said uh, we want to avoid uh, vague uh, post-capitalism and vague um, things that are, uh, of, of, of this sort, which I can understand. Um, vagueness is not a good thing. Uh, rather, we should focus on things such as civil rights or uh, uh, the, the understanding of, of the economy as a common project. Um, do you really think that civic rights taken seriously uh, with all, all what it means or uh, an economy understood as a common project is something that, is, uh, that has a place within capitalism? Uh, my answer would say, would say no. And then the, the fight to have real civic rights or an, or, or, or an economy that is really a common project would be a fight that would include or not basic income for very uh, contingent reasons and we, we would have to see. But uh, if, if I got it well, I mean, your commitment to, 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 to civil rights, uh, I mean, you, you equated that to, to, to well, taming, taming capitalism, but to me, uh, they don't have a space in, within, within really existing capitalism. Maybe in the blackboard, but, uh, but we know that uh, capitalism tries to, tends to undermine uh, civic rights in a, in a very profound way, and economic and social as well. But precise of that, also civic rights, right? Um, maybe I misunderstood something, and if, if, if this is the case, please uh, uh, clarify it to me. And, and, and hello, and big hug from, from Lleida. Any other questions? Someone else wants to address something? Okay, so maybe you can start answering these ones. Uh, on, on the first question on international monetary reform and, and UBI, I think it's, it's interesting to, to say it together. I, my criticism of international monetary reform, in a way, is similar to, to the criticism I placed on, on UBI, which is very often uh, a lack of conceptualizing money for, for what it is. And, and so, in a sense, would publicly created um, money and be, you know, it assumes that money is, is neutral. And, and therefore, I mean, I, I, one of the things I, I work um, quite a bit is on state theory, and it happens with, with state as well. It's a similar type of, of debate, that whether we think that the state is just some kind of neutral arbiter that depends on who takes power can do certain things with the state, and so if the good ones are in power, then we're going to have really good things, and if the bad ones get in power, then we're going to have really bad things. And I'm oversimplifying, obviously. but. There, there is a sense of, of actually lacking to understand the social relations that are embedded within either money or, or the state. So in that sense, I mean, one of, I think one of my favorite scholars uh, at the moment, conceptualizing money and particularly credit money, is I mentioned Suzanne Soderberg um, on, on that fair and, and other elements. And I think you know, she could be a really good introduction to, to understanding money in, in terms of those, of those social relations. But there's a lot of, of other people and classics, obviously, and go back to Marx. I mean, he was the one that, <laughs> that kind of did a better job at, at that. So, and, and to be fair, I know, um, you know, it might seem, sometimes we think he might be really hard to read, but actually he's much easier to read than most Marxists <laughs> after him. So it might be worth kind of um, going back to, to, to him to, to, to understand money a little bit more. And, and then um, the question from, from David. I wish UBI um, was the answer towards the collective control of the means of production. I think the answer towards the collective control of the means of production is the level of organization of the social forces. Whether UBI might be a contributing factor, might be, become a contributing factor to help that organization, Great, but it might not be. And so simply by itself, it's certainly not going to be because we could all be receiving our individual UBIs and stay at home and play video games. 
and watch TikTok videos, and that's not going to collectivize the means of production. So the, the means of production 200 years ago or today, they get collectivized by taking over power of, of them, in a sense. <coughs> and that, that actually requires a lot. You know, it's not, it's not easy. It requires a lot of, of organization. It requires um, a lot of, of raising um, consciousness. It, it requires a lot, of, a lot of things that, obviously, those things, um, there are many things that can help uh, UBI, um, a right to housing, a right to many, many rights, rights can, can help us, but also, you know, experience of previous struggles. So, so you know, there's, there's no, no easy answer to, to how we can, we can achieve that. But, yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah I mean, I, I agree with Monica here. I, do, I, I agree very much. I mean, I think, I think it also depends on what sort of conversation we're having, and maybe we're having slightly different conversations. So I don't disagree with David uh, either, but I think that you, David, you're talking in a sort of, um, well, obviously in a broad theoretical sense, uh, and you're talking in, not, not in a bad or negative way, but it, I think, as Monica was alluding to, I think you are already in a society where a lot of things have changed. So, so your thinking is at that level, and that would be a society where you have socialized the economy, uh, you have socialized many aspects of production, resources, distribution, and, and so on, and that's the only place, the only time you're going to have a UBI that's high enough to do the things that you're hoping for, because if you introduce a UBI now, it, you know, what about housing? You know, what about opportunities? What about employment? Yeah, you may do a few things, but you will still be dependent, right? You will still be dependent. So I think what, what, what I'm not just talking about civil rights as a, as a, in my own terms. I, I say UBI is a civil right, but it only works in the civic public. By this, I mean, I have in mind a range of civil rights, not just basic income. I think it would be quite frightening if a society decided to socialize all the resources and spend it just on the UBI. I, I think this, a real civic republic uh, would uh, be a differentiated republic, which uh, the independence of persons, as I've said, I've intimated in my, some of my writing, is constituted by a range uh, of rights. Uh, and so that's what gives individuals with autonomy. So rights in different spheres, care, occupation, uh, consumption, housing, and so on. And these are democratized spheres, and they would need to be democratized spheres, and they would, in that sense, help constitute the sort of uh, independent person, uh, discovered independent person um, that, that we're talking about. But I have always worried about putting too much of UBI alone. Um, so that maybe, maybe that's where, where we slightly disagree. In regards to the democratization of money, I mean, this is obviously fundamental. Um, but I, th I think, in, in a, so certainly in the Nordic welfare state, you went quite far in democratizing uh, many money, but not far enough, never far enough, because it was the civil society that democratized itself, but it was never able to democratize the sphere of finance. Uh, and, and that, of course, is what's needed in a wider sense, because at the minute the sphere of finance is sucking out money from the rest of the society uh, and, and enslaving the rest of the society in it. So yes, I agree, <laughs> there's a connection, strong connection. If I can just come in, because as, as Luis was answering, it, it also reminded me of, of something that Luis mentioned earlier, and I think it's important um, in connection with, with David's question, which is the, the element, a UBI in itself it can be a relatively individual um, policy. But what might be solidaristic, and that's kind of something that, that Louise alluded to earlier and becomes very important, is the fight towards achieving a UBI could be a very solidaristic fight. And if we think of you know, historical solidaristic fights in terms of, of labor unions or, or kind of struggles for, for the welfare state, it was the struggle that made it solidaristic, whatever the, the outcome might be. So, so what I would say is simply UBI to say would be um, something that would bring us towards the collective control of the means of production. My answer would be no. But the social forces behind fighting towards a UBI could open possibilities 
that would go beyond UBI towards, towards those things. So I think the, the aspect of, of solidaristic um, struggle is, is really important, and I think it, it was something that Luis already, already mentioned. Yeah. You wanted to say something, Luis? No, no, I was just going to say, I don't think all rights are gained through struggle. I think that they are sometimes they're gained through struggle, but there's often a kind of mutual constitution going on between the state granting something and society uh, expanding on it and sort of... But in the case of the, the pensions, uh, I look quite carefully at the pensions debate uh, back in the, the late 19th century, early 20th centuries in the UK and, and Denmark. And they, it was interesting because, uh, as I said, they came about quite early in Denmark and the state granted the right. But when it came to, uh, to sort of financial, a point of, of um, contention over the continuation of the universal right to pensions, because there was a question of whether the money could be spent elsewhere. The whole debate was framed around the fact that this right was now an expectation, that this right was now understood as a, as a, as a measure of citizenship, and it could be given away. So I think sometimes um, getting a, a, the state to grant something in universal terms can be very powerful for struggles. It can lead struggles as well. Uh, so, so we need to be sort of open, open to many different ways in which uh, a basic income could be out. But it's always important to mention that what we have in mind is an entitlement. I mean, one, one other thing with the, when, by liberal rights, I don't mean the, the sort of classical and liberal set of rights that is on the book, that individuals have to go and claim to enjoy. I mean civic rights more in the Nordic sense of rights that are available for you to enjoy. Right? It's very, very different. I talk about that in my, in my book, The Case for Universal Basic Income. The difference between rights that are there, you do not have to claim to enjoy, right? and, and rights you have to claim to enjoy. I mean, so, so for example, legal aid is a good example. In the UK, you used to get legal aid. Now you have to go, you still have a right to legal aid, but the hoops you have to go to to get legal aid means you will never fight a court case in your life. So, so there is also a question of whether rights exist to enjoy or whether you have to fight for them, to action them in your own life, individual life. So the, so the collective basis of rights is very important. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, something else from the public, the audience? Did you say the public in English? Yeah? <laughs> Audience, no? Yeah. Okay, so thank you, Monica. Thank you, Luis, for your contributions. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, we're finishing on time. That's great. And uh, simplemente eh, quisiera recordaros que mañana el simposio empieza a las 10 de la mañana, pero desde las 9 va a haber un desayuno aquí. Es decir, que podéis ir acercándoos a partir de las 9, aunque, aunque bueno, pues las sesiones como tal comenzarán a las 10. ¿vale? Y nada, muchísimas gracias a todos y a todas y un placer. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, Mónica. Thank you.